As a fitness professional, you know the joy of helping others, and you know it's more than just fitness. We're training the whole person. Wellness coaching provides expertise that goes beyond fitness and nutrition. It's a holistic approach to helping others become their best selves while reaching their goals. To us, there's no greater joy than that. Join the fitness leader. Become a fitness leader. Become a certified wellness coach. Go to nasm.org slash wellness. Well, hello there, listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of the Better Than Fine podcast, where you'll find a mix of positive psychology, fitness, and well-being best practices to help you make sense of all the wellness nonsense. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall, and just a few days ago, like so many people in North America, I got to see a total solar eclipse for the very first time. Uh, First off, if you didn't get to see it, if you have never been in a path of totality, I cannot stress this enough. If you ever get the chance again, do it. I spent 10 hours in the car on Monday to go to a place that is normally only two hours from my house. Uh, and for those three minutes of experience, it was worth it. It was so worth it that I didn't mind the 10 hours in the car. And, I, and it's honestly, I can say that it was one of the most incredible things that I have ever seen in my life. And I've, I've seen some cool stuff. Um, it felt to me, I've, I've, sp I've thought a lot about this in the last few days. It felt to me like the closest I'm ever going to get, at least in this lifetime, uh, to standing on another planet. And this very visceral, experiential connection to the greater forces of the universe while at the same time, I'm I'm just me standing here on the ground surrounded by hundreds of other just me's who are all looking up at the sky and going, wow, at exactly the same time. Um, I actually get really emotional when I think about it because it was that impactful. And so, of course, I've been thinking about this a lot over the last few days. Uh, and I knew this episode was coming up. And, and kind of the way my mind works is that if if I'm going through something significant or a whole, a bunch of my clients, there's a theme coming up. And, and if you're a fan of the show, you've heard me talk about this before that, that I'll pick up on that theme and try to ask myself, well, what is our current understanding of the human experience? And how can we look at that body of evidence and, and help us to relate to these big things that we're all going through? Um, many of often at the same time. And there's a powerful subset of emotions that we've talked about on the show before kind of in passing. So there's an episode on awe, there's an episode on gratitude. If you've listened to those, you've heard me talk about the concept of self-transcendence. But I haven't really unpacked self-transcendence before on the show. So I want to start off today's conversation with priming that pump. And you're going to understand why in just a second. So self-transcendence is when we feel not just like in concept, but an actual experiential feeling of connection or even a sense of identity with events or experiences or emotions that are bigger than whatever our current concept of ourself is. And so many of us, I think especially earlier in adulthood, your sense of self ends at the boundaries of like your skin, maybe your clothes, that like personal bubble. And so self-transcendence is when we have some experience that pushes and stretches that bubble a bit. Now, some people, when they experience self-transcendence, they then are sparked to see greater potential in humanity. They, uh, there's some evidence that shows that after self-transcendence, we are we're better able to accept paradoxes and some of the more difficult aspects of being a, a person. Um, people who have been self-transcendent, some of them feel more pro-social, like they'll, they'll do things that benefit other people. And so Maslow called those people transcenders. And Abraham Maslow theorized that transcenders who had these like profound self-transcendent epiphanies are actually how many religions get started. Uh, Viktor Frankl theorized that these are states that are naturally accessible to all people. It's just a question of whether or not you get exposed to the right circumstances. But those circumstances 
to to stimulate self transcendence are actually difficult to facilitate. You can't just like prime them in a lab. But we know that they have these benefits: pro social pro social behavior, seeking purpose and meaning, um, reshaping our concept of self and identity, often in more positive ways. Um, Self transcendence isn't always positive. Sometimes you feel really overwhelmed. Sometimes it could even feel terrifying. But when we can connect to these feelings that there's something greater than ourselves, we there is a, a, a subset of upside benefit for many many people. But as I mentioned, it could be difficult to facilitate. And how do you give someone like an awe induction as part of whether we're talking about their therapy or their self work? So I've heard, I've read some theory around using psychedelic compounds in order to stimulate self-transcendence and how that then relates to our well-being. And that evidence base, the relationship between psychedelics to self-transcendence to well-being is what got me interested in the concepts of psychedelics in the first place. Um, that, and I think there was a Tim Ferriss episode like 10 years ago that got me thinking about all of this. And so I was very excited when through a mutual acquaintance, uh, I was introduced to the work of today's guest. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that he's got a lot to say about all of that introduction. So Dr. Stephen Thayer is a clinical psychologist who specializes in psychedelic assisted therapy, practice, training, and research. He's got an impressive bio that begins in the United States Air Force. He's currently the lead instructor for Numinous for their wellness psych excuse me, Numinous Wellness is the name of the company, their psychedelic assisted therapy certification program, which I have just finished my first units in. Uh, I'm at the baby first step of, of taking that coursework myself, and I've really loved it so far. Uh, and Dr. Thayer co-hosts the Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers podcast. I'm very excited that he made the time to be here. So Steve, welcome to Better Than Fine. Thanks, Darlene. I'm excited to be here. Thanks. I'm very excited to have you. Um, let's just start with the obvious one. So anybody who's maybe behind uh, in some of the uh, current buzz, what do we mean when we talk about psychedelics and what psychedelic assisted therapy? Bring us up to speed. Yeah. So the term psychedelic, it's a, a term that was coined by a, I think, a British psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond back in the 50s. And it's a combination of some Greek roots of psyche, meaning the mind or the soul, and delin or delos, uh, meaning to manifest or to bring forward. So you can think mm. of a psychedelic experience or a psychedelic medicine as mind manifesting. And there are a lots of compounds, alkaloids, chemicals, drugs that fall under this broad umbrella that we call psychedelics. And there's some debate about which ones belong under that umbrella and which ones don't. But broadly defined, it's, you know, any medicine that occasions this non-ordinary state of consciousness in which the mind is made manifest. And it could be uh, content from the subconscious mind, or it could be content that is repressed or not uh, in our conscious awareness. Um, it could be a different sort of internalized parts of ourselves that we're not well acquainted with. And so this, some of the ones that people might recognize are things like so-called magic mushrooms and the, the chemical in mushrooms being psilocin or psilocybin that uh, occasions that non-ordinary state or LSD or sometimes referred to as, as acid. You hear people <laughs> dropping acid. Uh, these are tryptamines, fall into the sort of general drug class. And then there are phenethylamines like mescaline. Uh, this is a compound that comes from certain cactus species like peyote or San Pedro. And then sort of less commonly included, but often included are, are drugs like ketamine. People have probably heard mm -hmm. about ketamine. It's an anesthetic, sometimes called a dissociative anesthetic. If you've ever gone under for surgery, it's likely that ketamine was part of that anesthetic cocktail. It's given in emergency rooms to help calm kids down when they get stitches. Mm -hmm. But at certain doses, it produces kind of a disconnected, disembodied, dreamlike experience and has uh, been shown to be very effective in treating things like depression or helping people process trauma or even treating some anxiety conditions. Uh, some less well-known compounds like dimethyltryptamine or DMT. If any of you ever listened to Joe Rogan's podcast, you might <laughs> hear that meme like, oh, smoke DMT, mm -hmm. you know, eat some elk meat or whatever. So DMT <laughs> is, uh, yeah, exactly. Right. It's, um, it's found in a variety of plant species, um, probably most famously in this Amazonian brew referred to as ayahuasca, where they combine mm. a couple of different plant compounds, one that has DMT in it and the other has 
uh, an MAOI, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor that allows the DMT to be processed through the gut. <laughs> It's not going to be a quiz for me later, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm just sort of nerding out here. But... <laughs> no, I love your nerd out. <laughs> Keep going. Sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. Yeah, because otherwise, if you eat DMT, you don't feel anything. DMT mm, by itself is either that. smoked or, you know, injected or whatever. And uh, this leads to a very different kind of psychedelic experience than something that might be occasioned by mushrooms or LSD or, or ketamine. People sometimes report um, sort of this sense of self you mentioned transcendence before being dissolved. They experience this mm -hmm. oneness with, you know, the collective unconscious or the universe or God or the earth. Um, and sometimes with DMT specifically, they encounter what people describe as entities. It's, mm -hmm. it's the trip reports are not unlike what people describe when they've, you know, when they're describing alien abduction or near death encounters. Um, and then if you, you want to get real weird, you can do five MEO DMT which is a chemical that's found in the venom of the Sonoran desert toad. And so people, Lickin toad. Uh, it's like a Simpsons episode. You know what? The Simpsons has some great episodes on psychedelics. Um, yeah, they, do. <laughs> they really do. Yeah. But don't, uh, don't go out and lick toads people. A lot of those don't toads can kill toads. you, but um, don't do it. It's poison. <laughs> this particular toad, they, they milk the venom, they dry it, they crystallize it. And then it's smoked it, when it's studied in the lab or in clinical trials, it's synthetic. You know, they don't go out and harm mm -hmm. toads to get the, yeah. compounds but yeah so at the risk of droning on that's just a, a brief introduction no i think well i want to circle back because there's a few nuggets in the brief introduction and i want to invite the listeners who are maybe a bit more skeptical or just less familiar because i feel like for a certain subset of the internet or just self-work culture this has been brewing around for like a decade but i know that there are people who are adjacent that have questions that are just uncomfortable asking them um you talked about just altered mind states or, or um, I'm trying to think of the phrase that you use, but essentially like different states of in consciousness, you know, like William James's, um, you know, varieties of religious experiences. He just talks about that. Like, there's these non-normative consciousness states. And I think people are generally, I think anxious and a little bit afraid and trepidatious. So can you just speak to a little bit more about when we talk about non-normative states, I think people are afraid that they're going to like lose their mind. Right. Mm. Um, that something's going to happen and they won't, they'll be unmoored in a way they can't get back to. And I know that was my hesitance. Um, I did a lot of research before I let myself go down this path at all. Um, so can you just speak to the concept of a non-normative state of consciousness and, and why that can be beneficial? I mean, if that's not too big of a question. No, it's perfect. Perfect question. So um, to start, I, I generally encourage people to uh, approach non-ordinary states of consciousness, whether they're occasioned by a medicine or intense breath work or even flow states with respect and caution. So your extensive research is indicated. It's, it's important because there are some examples in history, ancient and modern, where people used these compounds uh, maybe uh, unwisely without adequate preparation or support and weren't able to handle this non-ordinary state. So um, I'll back up a bit and just kind of describe what we mean by that. So um, and if an ordinary state of consciousness is like, you kind of know who you are and where you are oriented to space and time, um, you have a good general sense of sort of uh, what you're trying to accomplish in any given day. A non-ordinary state would be something very different from that. So it could be a dreamlike state. It could be a state where you're very, very present, anchored to the moment and the past and the future are not relevant. Or like I referred to before, it could be um, a state where your sense of self is dissolved. We talk about psychedelics having ego dissolving properties. So ego, not as an egotistical, but ego in sort of the uh, psychoanalytic sense that uh, it's sort of your sense of self. So I talked about merging with the universe or merging with the earth that sometimes is a result of, uh, or I guess typical of th these types of non-ordinary states. And like you described with the eclipse, it, it can give a person a kind of perspective that can be really, really useful. So I'll give an example. Let's say you're plagued by depression and your depression features some really negative beliefs about yourself. I'm unworthy of love. I uh, don't like myself. And these thoughts feel unmovable. They feel stuck. They feel uh, like you, you believe them, even though you don't want to. Some of these medicines can dissolve that connection. 
between sort of this thinking machine that is your mind and the veracity of those thoughts. So mm. you get a break in a way that feels believable, almost more real than real. Um, and you get to feel what it feels like to put those thoughts in context. Like maybe it's possible. Maybe it's possible that I am lovable and I can open myself up to that possibility. For a lot of us, even if we've been through therapy or coaching or done a lot of meditation work, that can be really, really challenging. So in, in my world, at least, we talk about the use of psychedelics to assist growth. So psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, for example. It's not that taking one of these medicines or, you know, going out of the woods and doing mushrooms with your buddies is going to solve all your problems and sort of turn you into this transcended guru. Um, but they might help you break up some of the plaque so that you can move more freely. Yeah, I think it's so important that that last nugget that you just said is like the goal isn't that everyone is going to, you know, I don't know, move to an ashram and and give up their materialistic life, right? Like the goal is to assist whatever growth process someone is on, right? When we're talking about the context of psychedelic assisted therapy. And I think some of the people I've heard who are hesitant around this are afraid that it's going to spark something in them where they end up like dismantling their life and, and changing them radically. If you're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast, I'm your host, Charlene Marshall. The guest is Dr. Steve Thayer, and we're talking about psychedelic assisted therapy and how do we maybe shift some of our thinking about it as a culture and collectively and how it can benefit our well-being. Um, so let's backtrack a second then, because I think I've alluded to a few times people's hesitance. Can you just speak to, you know, why these things get a bad rap? Um, I think there still is a stigma. I don't know about you, but when I tell people, even the people in my, my personal life that I've like, oh yeah, I've started this psychedelic assisted therapy certification and the look on their face they're, where they're trying really hard to be open-minded, but I can tell that they're like, did you just tell me that you use drugs? Right. <laughs> um, so can you just speak to that? Um, and, and how, I don't know. I have secondary questions, but let's just start there. Like why, why are we in the bad rap state that we're in? Right. Well, so psychedelics have been used by people for thousands of years in various places in the world. You know, that we have evidence to suggest that they've been used um, by cultures to connect to the divine, like I've referred to. Um, some evidence, for example, the Grecian Eleusinian mysteries That's might my have involved. Favorite. Yeah, right. If you <laughs> want to learn more about, about all that, the time. You can read Brian Mirescu's book, The Immortality Key. But um, so that these, these, these mysteries that people like, you know, Plato uh, and some of these, uh, the fathers of uh, the modern enlightenment and stoic philosophers attributed a lot of their breakthroughs to was to go through this, these mystery rites and rituals. And there's some, again, some evidence suggests that involved in imbibing a substance called kaikion that could have had psychedelic properties. So just setting the stage that uh, altering one's consciousness with psychedelics has uh, been, been, around. been around for a long time. So that takes yeah. us to the 50s and 60s, where in the West, psychedelics are discovered. Gordon and Valentia Wasson go down to Mexico. Um, they're treated to a, a mushroom trip by uh, Curandera Maria Sabina, bring them back to the States around this time. Um, Albert Hoffman, Swiss chemist, discovers LSD, has his first trip known as Bicycle Day, where he ingests LSD, <laughs> a wild story. rides on his bike. And um, <laughs> so this sort of kicks off early research. You know, the, the mental health professionals who are exposed to these things are like, holy crap, these could be really, really useful. So it yeah. starts to be studies in the lab. And then um, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, it, psychedelics escape the lab and they enter sort of the counterculture scene. And that's where you get... Harvard psychologists like Timothy Leary and uh, Albert um, Richard Alpert. Richard Alpert, Ramdas, yeah, Ram big, big fan. <laughs> yeah, right. They start experimenting with these things. They get the attention of the government. You get the tune in, or turn on, tune in, and drop out recommendation from Timothy Leary. Uh, big, big fan surprise. of Ramdas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't right. know about tune in, turn out, drop out, or whatever. Uh, yeah. Anyway, please continue. I didn't mean to interrupt. Leary was on to some things, but he was definitely a maverick. And yeah. um, he wanted to disrupt the social order for sure. And he did that. And he got the attention of the government referred to as the most dangerous man in America. By yeah. uh, First, first two professor, tenured professors booted out of Harvard, right? I Didn't they go so. together? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think they both did. Anyway. So a big surprise when you do LSD and mushrooms and you feel unity with, you know, every human being in the world, you don't want to go fight in the Vietnam war. So, um, you know, this counterculture movement, 
again, um, sort of eventually results in the Controlled Substances Act. And these all these psychedelics that have been studied, uh, early research indicating they can be really effective for mental health treatment, substance abuse disorders, things like that, substance use disorders, are uh, put on Schedule One and made illegal. So the research stops. And then you have things for like, the, you know. For the listeners who don't know what Schedule One is, can you just clue them in? Because it's yeah. real. I think it's so important to the current movement where we are, if you understand why, what Schedule One is, what that means for drug distribution and usage and access, and why that is a radical thing to do in that moment. Right. So um, drugs are classified on certain schedules, and uh, the Schedule One suggests that uh, that this compound, this drug has no medicinal use and is addictive or dangerous. Yeah. So it's kind of hilarious if you look at the early research that psychedelics were placed on schedule one, because that was clearly not a scientific decision. Mm -hmm. It was a political decision. Um, and so, and, it's, uh, and especially in a context of a country that has regular access to alcohol, which has no medicinal use and is highly addictive, right? Right. Right. And so if we make the analog there, it doesn't make any sense. And to your point is therefore clearly a political decision. Right. And I think, you know, even cocaine and heroin, and I might be wrong about this, but they might not even be on schedule one because you, you can still, they're still Thanks. technically prescribable. Right. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's tragic. It's radical. Yeah. Yeah. So please continue. Tragic. I think because there was a lot of promise and it halted the research and slowed it down. So then, you know, I'm a child of the 80s and 90s. I remember the D.A.R.E. campaign. Yeah, I was a D.A.R.E. kid too. <laughs> seeing those commercials like, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, the sizzling mm -hmm. egg. and Did you so, have cops come to class and like show you the drugs in the plastic containers that like, and pass them around so you'd know how to identify them? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, for the bad kids in class, it was the instruction course. <laughs> I was like, okay, now I know what to get. So um, which corner should I avoid? <laughs> I was not that kid. My stepdad was a cop and I was terrified of everything. Um, so oh, that's yeah. why so many people in my life are very confused by adult Arlene at the moment. But um, but I think to some of your point, it's like we were raised in this context of it's it's going to eat your brain and it's you're going to be addicted because you tried the reefer one time. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I remember being told that if you drop acid, if you take LSD, it makes your brain swell and then your cerebral spinal fluid drips down your spinal column and that's why you get high. Um, that's not what happens. But <laughs> I remember being told that if you did, um, that if you took LSD and you like crack, you took it once and then for the rest of your life, every time you cracked your back, you'd get high again. <laughs> <laughs> And ecstasy puts holes in your brain. So that's the other one I remember. Right. Uh, it definitely yeah, does not. Yeah, clearly. All of these things. No, it definitely does not. Um, so obviously there's still the stigma that we're alluding to. Um, but I also, in the digging around I've done, have encountered this idea that they just erased the scientific evidence in history, right? It wasn't really broadly available for a long time because they wanted to bury this idea that it could be beneficial um, is that accurate? Perhaps, you know, there, there were perhaps, you know, bad actors that wanted to bury the research, um, from like a research institution perspective, the funding went away, right? They be it became illegal and, um, you know, these institutions couldn't get federal funding to study these drugs. And so mm. no more research. There were a few torchbearers who still tried to do some research here and there, but it wasn't until like the late nineties, early two thousands that psychedelics started to find their ways back into the lab. Yeah. So I want to pivot now, I think, away from this history context, because I, I, I'm sure our listeners have caught up now and talk a bit about how do we how do we create access? What does usage look like now? Where are we and, and how can interested people um, find this information and also find ways to have access if they're someone who's struggling and, and who who benefits? Um, you're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall. My guest is Steve Thayer, and we're talking about advances in psychedelic therapy. So when we set the stage of, you know, you got people who are dropping acid at clubs. I think we've alluded to ceremonial use, which I think is still active all over the world. 
And then of course there's this therapeutic context and who it serves. Um, would you mind painting a picture of that landscape for us? And then we can pivot a bit toward this, uh, the current therapeutic evidence. Yeah. So we're experiencing what's been referred to as a psychedelic renaissance. Uh, as psychedelics have found their way back into the lab, government organizations are uh, opening up to the, uh, the possibility that psychedelics could be very, very helpful. And so we're getting more funding. We're getting private companies interested in bringing drugs like LSD and psilocybin and MDMA through the FDA approval pipeline and making them prescribable medicines, uh, prescribable with the assistance of psychotherapy. Um, so it's kind of exciting. And especially in the last five years or so, you have books like How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan that comes out in, I think, 2018. And here you have a reputable journalist, popular for his books, talking about his personal journey using psychedelics and giving the historical context. And um, you have organizations like MAPS, now called LICOS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, that has been doing MDMA research forever, uh, that is now in August of this year, 2024, going to get a ruling on whether or not the FDA approves MDMA for this purpose. They've been doing a ton of research and their phase three clinical trial data is really, really promising in using MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD. So unfortunately in the States, uh, most of these medicines are still illegal. You might find like certain states where that's changed at the state level, like Oregon and Colorado, for example. And some cities too, right? Like the... Uh -huh. Cities the decriminalized plants movement in DC now, isn't it? DC also has a mm -hmm. plant decriminalization initiative. Yeah. And decriminalization is not the same thing as legalization, right? Oh, so, let's speak to that. <laughs> yeah. So decriminalization usually just means that it's a, a low law enforcement priority, or if you get caught with a certain amount of this type of drug, uh, you're not going to face criminal charges. But if you distribute it, if you sell it, if okay. you set, set up shop saying, I'm a mushroom therapist, you still could get into some trouble. Got it. So legalization, it has been legalized in certain places. Uh, and like you look at Oregon, for example, they actually have a state sponsored uh, psilocybin therapy initiative where there are now clinics that can do psilocybin assisted therapy and retreats in places like cool. Oregon. So not unlike cannabis, you know, that still hasn't received federal uh, legalization, but at state levels, it can be used either medicinally um, or quote unquote recreationally or for personal use. Psychedelics are kind of following a similar path, but, but if, for example, MDMA gets FDA approved, then that triggers a process at the state level where uh, it gets rescheduled. So it gets taken off schedule one and becomes whatever schedule they put it on, two or three. Um, so, and like I said, with MDMA, that's likely to happen this year in 2024, assuming it passes. Most of us in the industry are feel pretty confident about it given the data. Yeah. So some people are going out of country, right? They'll go to places mm -hmm. like uh, Amsterdam or they'll go to Central and South America for ayahuasca and mushroom retreats. Uh, and it's, it's tragic in a lot of ways. So I, I started my career in the Air Force. I'm an Air Force veteran and a lot of traumatized veterans with also, you know, things like traumatic brain injuries have to go outside of this country for powerful treatments. Um, if they can even afford to, like right. I, I work with the Travis Manion foundation and often I'm speaking with veterans who either they have PTSD, people from their unit have PTSD, and they're trying to get into any of the trials, you know, through the VA and, and the amount of hoops that they're jumping through and the expense to them, if they, so even if they can afford to go. Uh, it, it really is frustrating to me that I know, um, you know, some very bougie people who can drop whatever they need to, to go wherever in the world they want and have these helpful experiences. And I wouldn't take it away from them. But then the people I know who probably are suffering the most are the ones that are most inhibited because through their suffering, they're unable to gain that kind of stability. Right. Yeah. You have a few organizations, nonprofits like uh, Heroic Hearts is an example that tries to subsidize the expense and take veterans to places where they can get this kind of treatment. Um, but it is still very, very difficult to access. Uh, and so with respect to accessibility, you mentioned trials. So there are clinical trials being done on a variety of psychedelic medicines here in Utah, where I am uh, with Numinous, we do a variety of psychedelic clinical trials, but a clinical trial is really hard to get into. And there's a lot of exclusion criteria and it's a, it's a research study. So with most of these trials, they're placebo, double blinded placebo controlled trials. So it's possible you jump through all the hoops and you get a placebo. Um, 
And so sort of the it, trial ends and then so does coverage and the drug. I know a few people have had that experience too, and it's regrettable, but it's also part of how these things are structured, right? Right. Yeah. I mentioned ketamine earlier. So ketamine is one of those, again, loosely defined as a psychedelic, uh, that is accessible in most places. Uh, I will, you know, there's some caution to be taken there though, because not every ketamine clinic or ketamine practitioner is created equal. And, mm. uh, as a clinical psychologist, my bias is that if you're going to go to a clinic, ketamine clinic, it should be staffed by mental health professionals. Um, and that there should be a therapeutic component. You'll find sometimes these ketamine, these places that are there, they look like, you know, a place where you would get Botox and ketamine, or, uh, it's like a bunch of dentist chairs and they give you the drug and wish you well. These medicines can, like I said before, crack open the subconscious and can be destabilizing before they're helpful. Uh, and so it's important to have the right support. Yeah. You, you mentioned the power of personal anecdote and I've been on the fence as we approach this episode. And, and then we're also going to have John uh, Rosenberg on in a couple of weeks. And I was like, oh, am I going to talk about any of my own stuff? Um, but I recently took a larger dose of psilocybin than I had before. Um, and and got to that point where the the self was dissolving and really realized how in the wrong context with the wrong guidance and even the presence of a bad actor because i've certainly heard some of the, the horrible stories and where these compounds get used to manipulate people and and really remold their sense of self um, for all the wrong reasons and i you know i i wasn't quite flippant but it drove home for me the degree that I would never want to use any of these compounds uh, with somebody who did not have my best interest at heart and was in it purely to make money. Mm. And I'm certain that there are lots of people in this space right now who are doing it for uh, the amount that people are willing to pay for it. Um, I know one practitioner who it's it's eight grand um, to do and it's remote. <laughs> it's not, it's all virtual. Um, and, and I just thought that was wild. So just to echo what you're saying about like, it, it's not all sunshines and unicorns, uh, that, that there, it can be really overwhelming and intimidating. And, um, and that certainly had I not had the previous reps and good guidance going into that moment to, to breathe through it and be able to understand that it was going to be okay on the other side, uh, the overwhelm of that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really admire the self-disclosure. Thank you so much for bringing some of your own experience to this conversation because it helps to destigmatize, but also to educate and warn. Sometimes psychedelics are called non-specific amplifiers. So they take what's present and can potentially amplify them. So you can imagine without adequate preparation um, or support that it could amplify something that you feel very stuck in or destabilized by. And in the psychedelic assisted therapy process, we take a lot of time to prepare people, educate them about the experience to the extent that we can. Each experience is fairly unique and idiosyncratic, but, um, you know, give them some resources, practice breathing, practice grounding, do some preliminary psychotherapy before we even think about having a medicine session. And then the medicine session, uh, on the back of a, of a really good therapeutic relationship with the therapist is supported. And then there's a series of what we call integration sessions afterward, where we take time to reflect on what occurred, what you experienced. Is there any, any insights that you want to leverage for wellness and development and change and healing? Was there anything that was terrifying or confusing that you want to process? So that's a pretty thorough process, right? And it you can imagine it, uh, somebody's solo experience being potentially helpful, but uh, very different without that kind of process. Yeah, I think one of the things I really want to highlight that I appreciate about your process as I've learned more and, and more about it um, is the import of the integration session. Mm -hmm. um, my first psychedelic experience was with someone that I knew and trusted, um, but is not a clinician and did a, you know, did what I thought was a, a good job of guiding the journey the, that first time. Um, but I can look back now and see that the lack of an integration session or a few integration sessions, or even just an integration process really left me to my own devices. And I think about people who maybe haven't had that kind of instruction who are, you know, taking some shrooms on a sunny afternoon and going for a walk and have something profound happen and then don't have that guidance for how do I weave this into 
my self-concept and my belief about how the world works and um, just how important that that is, especially if you're someone who is experiencing some mental health challenges. Um, I don't know if you want to speak any more to that. A little bit. Yeah. Um, so Please. I want to make sure that uh, I'm not sounding territorial, right? Like no. I said before, <laughs> people have been using this stuff for a long time. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and a, and a researcher, so I come at it with a certain type of bias or lens. But I also believe in cognitive liberty and that people ought to be liberated to alter consciousness if they want to. But uh, my goal would be to provide as much education and resource for support as possible for people who choose to do that. And along the lines of the respect that we should have for these medicines, there are folks that, um, at least from this psychologist's perspective, probably should stay away from consciousness altering drugs. You know, the, the classic exa example that we use in my industry is, you know, people who have um, psychotic disorders who already have a loose grip on reality, maybe shouldn't shake that snow globe really vigorously with a, <laughs> a psychedelic. <laughs> I just got to make sure my snow globes are not tight and screwed on real tight. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's speak to that a little bit more because I think it's important that um, I've, I've heard it said, and I would love you to correct me if I'm misrepresenting this at all, that part of what's happening is an increase in kind of like the flexibility, malleability of um, of what's going on in the brain. That is not at all a technical term, but that's the best I got at the moment. Um, and providing a bit of malleability. And so if you're somebody who your snow globe's a little bit loose already, right, like maybe right. you're not you don't have that cognitive stability, um, that it can upset the apple cart. I've mixed like five metaphors now. Um, <laughs> can you, so I guess what I'm saying, where I'm going with this is, is that a, a, an accurate metaphor of like the malleability idea and, um, who, whom is psychedelic assisted therapy a good recipient for? Mm. Um, I think we've established who it's maybe not great for, uh, and then I've got I got kind of like one more big beat I want to pick your brain on, but let's just go there for now. Yeah. So one way to answer that question is like, what are psychedelics doing in the brain? Yeah. And depending on the chemical, a lot of these, especially the um, tryptamines I mentioned, they bind to serotonin receptors primarily, 5-HT2A receptor in the brain. Um, no and then some of them would bind to other receptors and, and promote the release of certain neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, oxytocin. So to your point about flexibility or non-flexibility, uh, there's this researcher, probably one of the, the biggest neuroscientist researchers in psychedelics, Robin Carhart Harris, who's coined this phrase, the rebus model, relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. Mm. And anybody who's looked into the psychedelic research has probably heard the term default mode network before, the DMN. We've talked about it on the show a bunch. <laughs> yeah. So in brief, the default mode network being sort of just this connection of networks in the brain, of regions in the brain that are typically active when somebody is is uh, sort of lost in thought or engaged in self-referential thinking. We, we need this, this network. It's important for survival. But it can also be the seat of some of that rumination, that, uh, that sort of obsessive thinking stuck on negative things that people with uh, psycho psychological challenges suffer from. Psychedelics deactivate the default mode network. So does meditation, right? When they when they were doing brain imaging studies on experienced meditators and people taking psychedelics, they saw similar downregulation of the default mode network. It also causes communication between brain regions that don't normally communicate, which might be responsible for some of the, well, the weird subjective experiences that people have on psychedelics. For instance, synesthesia, where senses blend. You know, you might hear colors I heard, or I was seeing them. the music last time. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool. Actually. <laughs> it was really cool. Yeah. And sometimes it causes visual hallucinations and, and all those things. So here we have increased neuroplasticity and communication between brain regions. And then some psychedelics have been shown to actually increase what we call synaptogenesis, neurogenesis, dendritic spine growth, actually creating new connections between neurons. So this has implications for traumatic brain injury, you know, maybe conditions even like chronic pain or, um, you know, neurocognitive decline like Alzheimer's. But also if you think about any well-worn pathway in your brain that's responsible for a certain set of beliefs, it can get adjusted and made more flexible. 
And we see that this period of neuroplasticity or psychological flexibility, depending on the medicine, depending how long you're under the influence of the medicine, can last for a couple of days to several weeks after ingesting the medicine. So it's why me as a therapist really likes this idea of psychedelic assisted therapy, because now I have a plastic brain that me and my client can work with. And maybe we can make some changes that then when that brain quote unquote cools, uh, it's cooled in a structure that is more amenable to psychological well-being. Yeah, I'm, I'm grinning at the uh, the both literal plasticity and also the metaphor of plastic being reshaped and cooling. Um, and I'm also thinking about, you know, you, you alluded to this, but I think it's a really important thing to circle back to. And so I'm, I'm going to do it before we lose the thread of the territorial aspect. Mm. And I'm so grateful that you had made that comment about, you know, not gatekeeping. Um, I know some other clinical practitioners who are very gatekeepy about the idea that these compounds should only be used in a therapeutic context, um, that we have too many other people out here talking about trauma that, um, you know, aren't licensed clinicians. And I, I just want to highlight and also throw back to if there's anything else that you had wanted to say about the idea that people have been using these compounds, um, you know, time and memoriam, uh, mm -hmm. and that often in a spiritual context or a ceremonial context, and to say that they're only for this one thing. Um, and we're going to talk about this a lot more in two weeks when John Rosenberg comes on, but can you just speak to some of that more open horizon of the other reasons that people might choose to use compounds like this that aren't necessarily like, okay, I'm here to treat my PTSD. I'm here to work on my depression. I'm here for anxiety. Like these are very mm -hmm. specific things that I think to your point should be treated with a clinician, but there's also a lot more potential here. Um, and, and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So I think some of the territorialness or gatekeeping from the medical pr professions, um, is, I guess it's an outgrowth of trying to shoehorn an ancient technology that was made illegal. It's not well understood into the Western medical model. So, you know, the Western medical model being if something's wrong with you, it's something self-contained within your body, within your brain, you need mm. something external like a drug to help make things right. So you might've heard the, the chemical imbalance theory of depression, which mm -hmm. uh, has been disproven and even shown to the term chemical imbalance, probably more of like an ad campaign from pharma companies than coming from the research. Um, so, you know, this idea, like if you have an illness, you need to be treated by a doctor. I get it in a lot of con con contexts. That's really, really important. Like I mentioned people with severe trauma, severe mental illness, it, it, it probably could be a good idea to see a, a professional trained with good uh, skills and in safe contexts uh, if they're going to go through with this. But, um, you know, like I mentioned before, these medicines have been used in ceremonial contexts, spiritual contexts, rites of passage uh, in ways to help um, sort of communicate with the divine or increase creativity for a lot more years than Western medicine has been around. So I think it does make sense in some contexts, like you certainly don't want the Instagram shaman to charge you $8,000 <laughs> to give you mushrooms because they did it at Coachella and now they think they're a guide. Um, so, you know, uh, just... we, we laugh, but also, no, I don't. And that person definitely exists. Yeah. And in my practice, yeah. I've had people who've been harmed in those contexts, you know, come yeah, to me to yeah. put the pieces back together. So, but I've also personally experienced tremendous growth and healing and perspective in more ceremonial circles. And one of the things that I think the Western medical model, specifically with mental health, doesn't get well, doesn't get right, is that what is wounded in connection and community needs to be healed in connection and community. So if you are a trauma victim, you know, who, who grew up um, with a really difficult family environment and, or maybe was the victim of systemic oppression and you go to your doctor and they give you a pill because something's wrong with your brain, um, we're not looking at the whole picture. So I do some group work, for example, and I've seen people make connections with other group members that I would never have been able to help them make just in a private psychotherapy or coaching context. Um, and we mentioned the veterans, like a lot of what these veterans get out of those treatments that they go to is 
uh, sort of this communitas, right? This shared experience of you folks know what I'm going through, even if it wasn't the exact same thing. And I feel the shame melt away from me. I feel accepted and connected. Belonging. Belonging, exactly. Yeah, I think that's that's huge. And and I think the other thing that, that medicalization doesn't always take into account and, you know, coming from positive psychology, the absence of the bad isn't the same as the presence of the good. And so mm. I can resolve someone's depressive symptoms or anxiety or breath work or like whatever magic tool we want to, you know, throw on the table. That's not the same as the presence of something like belonging or a feeling of gratitude, a feeling of transcendence, you know, like there's an additive component as opposed to just the mitigation. And that's, that's mostly what we're going to talk to John about is the vision for what that might look like. But if you want to speak to it at all, as we're coming to the end here, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I, it's part of why I mentioned the sort of cognitive Liberty. I think there's an opportunity with psychedelics to not only, as you say, go from quote unquote sick to well, or I guess sick to not sick would be uh, yeah. more apropos. Neutral, neutral gear. Yeah. But you know, your reference to Maslow's work to actually get to self-actualization and then through to transcendence, um, or just, you know, use them for creative expression and exploration, or you want to explore the, the fabric of reality. This is an interesting tool to change that antenna in your brain. Um, so I think, uh, one way this is done with psychedelics is through what we call micro dosing. So what I've been talking about so far are, so are like macro doses or doses high enough to really alter consciousness in a perceptible way. But some folks, there's not as much research on this, but certainly a lot of um, case examples in communities that like to take certain psychedelic compounds in small doses, so-called micro doses, which is sub intoxicating. You don't often notice any perceptual changes, but you might notice, you know, a loosening of uh, your inhibitions, or you might notice a little bit more creative thought, or you might notice that you're less encumbered by self-limiting beliefs. And there's a lot of precedent for using either micro or macro doses to help people, uh, you know, solve complex problems or create beautiful art and music. We just interviewed a guy on our podcast, Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, named Paul Austin, who's the founder of Third Wave, and is one of these, these big proponents of using microdoses in this way. And he wants to bring microdosing to enterprise, right? To the, to the leaders of industry, not just to make them like richer billionaires, but like to, to, to get them more conscious. More and, pro-social. Uh, more pro-social, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I see that. I buy that. Where do I sign? <laughs> I really appreciate, you know, the, the framing of the conversation, you know, obviously having a guest on you have a podcast, you know, that you invite someone in and you know that there's some richness there. Um, and while I know we did a lot of table setting in the beginning to, to come to this point toward the end where it's much more about what, what could we be doing? Right. Cause when I heard you speak the first time um, you talked about, we have to start with, the, the most challenging case is to just prove a point, right? Like mm -hmm. the biggest need. So treatment resistant depression with suicidal ideation, right? Like these are the people that nothing's working and maybe this will work. And if it helps them, then we can leverage, well, who else could it help? Um, but I think it's really excited to get to this moment where, all right, we've got an evidence base. The, the train is leaving the station. Now what? Um, and I'm, I'm giving a little preview of this conversation with John, but also even just hearing this idea, like you're saying about third wave and how do we help heal some of these big class divides? How do we get people more interested in taking care of the planet? What does meaningful change look like? And one of my points of interest in this topic is I think that this is one tool toward that. Um, and so thank you for making the time. And if you've got any final thoughts on, on that last point, um, please share them. Yeah, just a, a, I guess one final thought is um, the polarization of America and sort of the human species at large into these warring tribes is not new to our species, but it's been amplified by things like the internet and social media. So, you know, a, an experience occasioned by a plant alkaloid or an animal alkaloid or a synthetic chemical that makes us want to hug each other, that makes us want to understand each other, that puts us our existence into perspective, not unlike the eclipse did for you, um, I feel like is 
it, it's never more needed than now. So I'm hopeful that psychedelics are one of the perhaps many tools that can help us reclaim who we are and remember uh, that we're all one big happy, well, not happy, but could be happy human family. <laughs> yeah, we're one big human family with a lot of potential. There you go. I like it. Beautifully put. Uh, where can people find you and your work, please? Yeah. So I mentioned our podcast that I co-host with Dr. Reed Robison, Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. We do weekly episodes. Some of them are conversations between me and Reed, and we bring on people to interview. Uh, I have a website, drstevethayer.com, where I have, I have a small private practice among the many things that I do. Too many irons in the fire. But uh, <laughs> if any of you are interested in training to become a, a practitioner, uh, using psychedelic tools, the company I'm affiliated with, Numinous Wellness, has that you mentioned that uh, training program, a pipeline that gives people the the information and skills they need to to use these medicines effectively and ethically. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just plug that I I finished the introduction module a few weeks ago. Uh, very accessible, even for somebody who's not looking to um, go into some kind of practice using these tools. I think it's a great foundation um, of understanding and framing of the conversation. If you want to get what this all is about, um, I, I can't recommend it more. Dr. Well, Steve Thayer, you. thank you so much for joining the show. I really, really appreciate your time and your expertise. My pleasure. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Of course, I would love to hear any of your feedback on this and any other episode of Better Than Fine. So you can find me, uh, shoot me an email. It's info at darlene.coach. Of course, I'm on Instagram. It's also darlene.coach. And yes, my website is darlene.coach. If you're a fan of the show, I hope you've already subscribed. But if you haven't, go ahead and do that right now. Uh, be sure to hit that like button if you're watching us on YouTube. And of course, we live stream the show every Wednesday at 4 p.m. on the NASM YouTube channel. Thank you so much for everybody who wrote us a review. If you haven't already, please go ahead and do that because it helps us game that algorithm and sharing is caring. So tag me if you do. Thank you so much. Take good care of yourselves and be well.